Good morning from Grace Center, Houston. We're going to sing Christmas Christmas. We have um, Scarlet and we have our grandson, uh, which is Scarlet is um, Sharon. Cute boots. <laughs> We're going to start off number one, honey. Angels we've heard on high. Granddaughters. <laughs> Angels we have put on, sweetly singing o'er the plains, and the mountains in reply, echoing that joyous Song two, away in a manger. Yeah. You can look up here and look at right here. Remember how you were watching yesterday? Yes. Okay. Away in manger, number two. There's a little intro to this, so give it just a second. Hang on.
word. Of Bethlehem. Is that what the page is at? Six. This is number six. six. The last one. Page six. Oh. <laughs> Amen. Did we sing them all? Did we do a way in manger, love? Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay, I thought we had five. This one too? Yes. And this one? Yes. Hark the Herald Angels Sing? Okay. That's the one we did. Uh, page four. Page four. Mm-hmm. And we're Mark crummy the at the second verse, so we're just going to sing we're the first sing. one. We're just going to sing the first verse twice. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's too page complex. Four. Just a second. Amen. Lord, thank you, Jesus, for that. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, amen. A Benjamin generation. Thinking of that saying, 
wise men still seek him. Right? And, I mean, in the world, um, they identity is a weakness sometimes. You know, saying to me when I first got saved, oh, that's just for people who need a crutch. And I was like, what? But the scripture says wise men seek him. So you're actually not ignorant, you're wise Amen. to seek him. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you, Jesus. Yes. Because even if you are ignorant, when you find him, you've just found the fount of all wisdom. Amen. 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 So uh, praise the Lord. Amen. Praise Amen. Good word. Thank you, Jesus. I want to be wise. <laughs> and Amen. the other thing is the gold follows Jesus. Yeah. Remember the three wise kings? What did they bring? Gold. Yeah. Gold. Frankincense. And yeah. So we don't have to seek the gold. We seek him because the gold comes from Jesus. Hey, yes, it does. He gives us the so ability it's not only to wisdom, it's make well. Yes, and amen. long life. Yes. Amen. Amen. Long life too. Amen. And I look for this next year to be the best year ever for amen. us. For us all. Amen. It's been a great year. Thank you. Amen. Hey, well, it's good to see everybody this morning. Good morning, Mary and Susan and Wayne and David and well, I need a little crutch this morning. I, I think about half of us have a little tickle in our throats, so I'm gonna I'm gonna try to get through this today. Uh, if not, we can go eat earlier. How about that? Uh, everybody doing okay? Yes. Good. Good. Yep. Crockett's doing very good. I love I love their names. You know, they they have some really. All right. Well, anybody else want to share just anything before we get started? Uh, any other announcements? We're not going to have a service next week. For Christmas weekend, we're going to take that that weekend off. We we are going to try to have one on the thirty first. Uh, as of now, we're going to say yes. If there's a change with that, we'll we'll let you know. Um, bring this over just a little bit, Marcus. This is a quiet group today. I know everybody's thinking about what's on the menu at Saltgrass, right? <laughs> dessert, yeah. It's going to have heard several people say they don't. They're thinking about their dessert first, and then. So, well, all right. I think maybe I'm leveled out now. Okay, well. Um, Let's just get into the Word for a few minutes. Uh, we, we're going to continue looking at Romans chapter 8. Um, and then the, the remaining part of the year, 
I really want to focus in on the Word on the last day of the year. I just There's some things he's been sharing with me about the Word that I think are just really important. Uh, it may take us another, goodness, another maybe another three weeks to get through Romans 8. Um, there's just so much here. And uh, I hope you all are reading uh, along with you know, not just what, not just reading along and in, in, during our time together, but reading uh, um, when you when you get home and during the week, just keep looking at it and keep looking at it. The message today is is the title is called True Love, um, and uh, <clears throat> you could say this is a, either a, you could say this in both a noun and a verb. A sense, and Jesus is really both. He is, and gives, true love. This is we've had quite a day so far. We've got some water leaking over here, and hopefully we can keep our uh, we can keep our connection here today. If not, we'll just do our best. How about that? All right. So let's turn in Romans chapter eight. Romans chapter eight. And let's start, we're going to start with verse 18 today. Chapter 8, verse 18. What's the, what's the title over this one, this section? I keep talking about our destiny because I think it's so important for us to keep in mind um, where we're headed. You know, where we're, where we're, where we're, where we're going to end up in the, in the long, long run. And uh, or maybe in the short run, it may not it may not be that much longer until this what this section is all about. Um, but he he uh, he starts out, and this is probably the one of the most um, uh, pivotal or or kind of profound things that I I don't know that I've ever heard Paul anyone say like Paul is saying right here, and he says I'm convinced. That any suffering we endure is less than nothing. It's less less than nothing compared to to the magnitude of the glory, and that word glory is the word doxa, uh, which, if you look at the footnote there, is radiant beauty, splendor, and perfection. So um, he's saying that has anybody. Anybody endured anything in this life? I think what he's trying to say here is that there's that, that whatever that is that we've had to face, whatever we've had to endure, that he's going to tell us the reason why here in just a second. But he's saying in, in light of where we're headed, it's less than nothing in importance. But when you look at it from the world standpoint, and I, I know every, pretty much everybody in here pretty well, and, you know, uh, sometimes the stuff that you that you go through and that you endure can try to cause you to switch your focus on that being somehow your identity is what you've suffered. Um, you know that 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 sort of becomes the thing that sort of we focus our life on is we've endured this stuff and now you know this is kind of why I'm this way and who I am and. And uh, I, I just, you know, uh, I've, I've got to figure out a way to, to, to deal with it and, and, and to make this not be, you know, something that, you know, I guess the world would say takes, takes us down or takes us out. But what, what, what Paul's saying, what Paul is trying to say is here that, that our true identity is in Christ and in our, the, where, we're, where we're headed, where we're going to end up, the glorious destiny that we have ahead. So I just thought that's, you know, not only is it nothing, but it's less than nothing. How do you get less than nothing? Really? You know, that's, but that's what, I mean, he really meant that. That's, that's how irrelevant it is to what we have versus what we think is taking away what we have. Um, I've been through some stuff. Anybody, I mean, Mark, I know Mark's been through, we've all been through some stuff. But it's not... It, it, it's you know, it's just not what we what the enemy wants to keep telling us it is. 
Uh, so let's, let's read on. We just have about 13 verses here. I'd just like to go through this first, and then we'll branch off from there. Uh, the entire, the, the, I love this, where he, where he goes from here, because he says the, the entire universe is standing on tiptoe, yearning to see the unveiling of God's glorious sons and daughters. Isn't that amazing? Uh, for against its will, against the, the, the universe, so the, the wasn't, you know, it wasn't the, the will of the universe for the things that happened that had to happen. Uh, but nevertheless, the universe is even realizing that, 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 that this stuff, that everything that has, has been shaken is, is going to be shaken uh, so that everything that can't be shaken is going to remain. And so the, uh, the unveiling of the sons and daughters, for against its will, the universe itself has had to endure the empty futility resulting from the consequences of human sin. But now, everybody say now, with eager expectation, all creation longs for freedom from uh, the bondage uh, to decay and to experience with us the wonderful freedom coming to God's children. Uh, to this day, we are aware of the uni of universal agony and groaning. So here's here's the first there's of three groanings. The universe is groaning. It's not happy with what's turned out. That's why what the things that we've endured and have been through. That's why we're not happy with them either, because it was the, the it was because of sin entering the world. It says in, in that Paul said that by one man's disobedience. Uh, sin entered the world, and then death by by sin. Uh, so death was never been supposed to be a part of our life. Uh, nevertheless, it became that way. But there's a change coming. Uh, in that groaning, it's, it's as if we're the contractions of labor for childbirth, and it's not just creation. We who have already experienced the first fruits of the Spirit, all of us that have had the Holy Spirit. Uh, reveal to us the truth of the gospel and the truth of what what's, uh, Jesus has done to correct the things that were messed up by the one man who messed it up. Thank God another man came along named Jesus Christ and he reversed the curse. He reversed what, what was, what was uh, 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 against us. And it's not just, uh, let's see, it, it, but, and then we inwardly groan as we passionately long to experience our full status as God's sons and daughters, including our physical bodies being transformed. For this is the hope of our salvation. But hope means that we must trust and wait for what is, what is still unseen, for why would we need to hope for something that we, that we already have? So because our hope is set on what is yet to be seen, we patiently keep on waiting for its fulfillment. I've seen... I've seen uh, you know, um, I, Deborah was saying something yesterday about, you know, you, you there's there's a patience that develops in us when we know the hope is secure, right? Yes. You know, sometimes I wish it was a little quicker in some areas. I wish that things would change or things could be uh, redeemed in a way that we could, that would be manifested in our life, healings and things like that. And I do believe that the Holy Spirit is still involved in the body of Christ worldwide to bring those things about. But what Paul's talking about here is, is much greater than just a few things happening. This is the, 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 the finish line coming to where this natural body will no longer be natural. Uh, you know, I'm hearing, you know, some of the, in some of the grace circles you have these, I call them novel teachings that are coming in where... Uh, People, you know, where a lot of some of the grace teachers are saying that we could, that we can just, at some point, we're going to just transcend and we're we're going to we're going to transform, kind of like Jesus did on the Mount of Transfiguration. We're going to transfigure, and that that's coming up soon in the church. I don't I, I don't I think that's true. In fact, I know it's not true, and I'll tell you why in a minute. I'm always going to back everything I have. Uh, up with what I what I say with Scripture, Amen. So we're living in what I call an already not yet reality. We already are seated with Him in heavenly places spiritually. Our spirit man has been reformed. 
Uh, we've been born from above. You've got to be born from, from both atoms, though. You can't be born just of the first atom. You've got to be born of the, of the last atom, Jesus Christ. So, um, and we're going to see that it's in this passage as well. But, <clears throat> so you have to be born again to be part of what we now have is our sharing, our, our co-glorification with Jesus means that we share his crucifixion, his burial, uh, his resurrection, his uh, ascension and his seating in, in heavenly places. We are sit- currently, right now, today, and forever. You can read about this in Hebrews 12. We have already come to Mount Zion, it says. We're already there in our, the spiritual reality of who we now are. Uh, it's, a beautiful, it's a beautiful statement uh, that, that Paul, I believe it's Paul writing when he talked in Hebrews 12. That is our reality, but we don't see the, the body, this physical body, is still uh, subject to futility and, and decay because it's still connected to this world, this, this world that, that was, was uh, put in, in, in uh, decay. That, and that's why there's a groaning for this to happen. Um, I know uh, K- uh, Kim was talking about uh, the other day, I heard where she was talking about uh, the fact that, <clears throat> uh, how about today? How about today this, the, 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 G- that Jesus would come back? And I'm going to give you a verse to write down, and I've given this to Tom before. But it says, uh, I believe it's, let's see, let me, let me find it. I wrote it down here somewhere. Um, for, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 12 says that we can actually hasten his uh, revealing or his, the revelation of Jesus. We can hasten it, make it happen quicker by having an earnest desire for it to happen. And, and he said, uh, and then we use I, the word Maranatha is, everybody know what that's a, Greek, that's a Greek word, Maranatha, which means Lord, come quickly. So come quickly, Lord Jesus. Yeah, so there's, there's a desire in all of us to see there's a groaning going on in us because I don't want to be left just half done, right? I don't want just the already not yet. I want already and then complete, completion. Amen. So uh, that's where Paul is trying to go with this passage in, in chapter 8. And so um, the, uh, and in a similar way, it says we, we're waiting on it patiently. Then verse 26, and in a similar way, the Holy Spirit takes hold of us and our human frailty to empower us and our weaknesses. For example, at times we don't even know how to pray. Anybody been there? How about this week? That's why we have the Holy Spirit. Because He knows how to pray. And if He's living in you, it says right here, you got, you got the Word of God on it. This is, this is Paul saying right here that we don't, even know, we don't even know how to pray or know the best things to ask for. But the Holy Spirit rises up from where? From within us to super intercede on our behalf, pleading with God with emotional size uh, too deep for words. Sometimes you just can't put words to what's going on in you that you're looking for an answer to that doesn't seem to have one, right? Living with the, un- the, living with the um, ir- ir- irreconciled, uh, the unreconciled, living in the, with the unreconciled. The Apostle Paul dealt with that all the time. Uh, he left this earth living in thing, with things being unreconciled. But by, the, by the, the anointing and power of the Holy Spirit, uh, he wrote this scripture to give us hope. Amen? And so he's... Uh, so God... The searcher of our hearts knows fully our longings. I love what the footnote says here on that, on verse 27. Every, everybody, everybody say every. every. Every new creation heart longs to be fully his. Amen. 
Amen? Yet he always, he, he also understands the desires of the Spirit. Did you know, uh, if you want to write this down at the top of the page there, unless you're Tom, you can write it on your paper. Uh, <laughs> I keep picking on Tom because I can't, I can't pick on Paul anymore because he writes in his name. Uh, but uh, Galatians chapter 5 verse 17 says that the Holy Spirit actually has intense cravings for, our, for us. He has intense cravings for us. Um, and He wants us to come into a reality of what we now have in Christ. Amen? So the, Holy, the Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is passionately pleading before God for us, His holy ones, in perfect harmony with God's plan and our destiny. Okay, so, now, um, so we are convinced. Are you convinced this morning? Yes. He wants you to be convinced in your heart not to let the things that you've endured become your identity, but that your new identity in Christ that's going to be completely unveiled uh, soon uh, in this world. The universe is on tiptoe, so it's got to be... You can't stand on tiptoe forever, you know. But the Holy Spirit, I mean, the, the, there's three times the groaning is used in this passage. So uh, there's a whole lot of groaning going on. I've been groaning a lot this week. Zine, I was, um, was hoping that she'd be here. Maybe, maybe she'll get a chance to listen. Because I wanted to address a question uh, that she had last week. Anytime you have questions, come, at, come ask me and I'll try my best to answer them in a way that you feel like you really have an understanding of it. So, um, so we are convinced that every detail of our lives is continually woven together for good. Does it seem like it's good sometimes? But from his perspective, it is. In fact, even character is something you can't get until, unless you're developing it, right? I don't know what, you know, there's mysteries. Paul, Paul calls them the mystery of iniquity. He calls it the mystery of ungodliness. He calls them the mystery of godliness. There's lots of mysteries that we don't think, what in the world is all of this kind of, what is this about? Why do we, you know, why do we have to go through this stuff? And he knows, and, and sometimes uh, we don't have to know. But we can trust that it, there is a purpose in it to bring us to a place of being more like him. Right? Is it always easy to forgive everybody? No? No. Well, I'm sure, you know, God had to give up his own son. So it's not an easy thing, but it's a God thing. Right? So, there, there they are. I'm just about to get to Zine's question. So, I, I, I waited just in time. We're, we're in Romans chapter eight, and uh, hope you don't mind me saying that you had a question last week that that I wanted to try to answer and address. So, ding, perfect, perfect time. Yeah, right, right place, right time. Okay, so, where did I leave off? I mean, we're in 28. Okay, for we, are, for we are his lovers who have been called to fulfill his designed purpose. That's, I, want you to, I want you to, I circled it in mind, designed purpose. God has a designed purpose. Nothing is random with him. There's, there's no randomness. There's randomness in the fallen creation, right? Sometimes it's pretty random. Sometimes it's not good. But it's still, there, it, with God, there is a design purpose. No matter what, the, what the, the, the futility of the creation being, God had something better in, in mind and in His plan from before the fall. He already had a correction in place, and that was, that was the cross, 
Uh, so for he knew all about us before we were born, and he destined us. Okay, this again, this is part of the design purpose. The, the footnote there on destined us is sealed us. We're sealed into the body of Christ. He knew all of us, he knew all about us before we were born, and he destined us, he sealed us from the beginning to share the likeness of his son. You were, you were sealed and destined to be just like Jesus by the Father. That's almost too hard, uh, too, too good to be imaginable. Uh, but this is the thing. Now, uh, this means, and this is where Zine's question last week comes in, you know, trying to explain how we are one with, with the Father and one with the Son and yet we're still who we are. Well, that's, like, that's kind of in a sense trying to explain the Trinity. The word Trinity is not in Scripture, by the way. But the Trinity, but, uh, the, the, the Trinity is uh, made up. Uh, it's, a, it's an inseparable yet three... Dis- it's inseparable. The, the three members of the Trinity are inseparable. You can't divide one from the other. And yet they're three distinct persons. And so we are in the same way. And look, look at what he says right here in verse 20, uh, 29. This means the son is the oldest among a vast family of brothers and sisters who will become just like him. Just like him. You have become just like him in your spirit, your you're unified in one spirit with the Lord. He who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with the Lord. You're one spirit with Him already. Your spirit, man, can never be corrupted again. It had to be born of an incorruptible seed. Was Adam's seed cor- cor- uh, incorruptible? No, because it got corrupted. That's why there's a distinction that God makes between the, the incorruptible seed and the corruptible seed. Uh, Adam was made very good, but not perfect. But when you're born again, you're, you're perfected by one sacrifice forever. There, there can never be a corruption in your spiritual makeup again. You're just like Jesus in your spirit. And one day we're going to be just like him in his body now, that he now has. And that's what he's trying to say here, that even though there, we're, there are many parts to the body of Christ, many, many members. In fact, he said, I love the word vast there. Aren't you happy it's a vast number? A vast family of brothers and sisters. I know you may not all want to be my brother uh, or my sister forever, but you are if you're in here today and you're a believer. So uh, We're going to look at that in more detail in just a second here. Let's see. Having determined our destiny ahead of time, he called us to to himself and transferred his perfect righteousness to everyone he called. And those who possess his perfect righteousness, he co-glorified with his son. (coughs) I knew that might happen. So, uh, and of course, being co-glorified, we already explained what that is co-crucified, co-buried, co-raised, co-ascended, co-seated. Can't get any more glorious than that. Now, we're going to stop there in Romans 8 today, okay? Okay. Now, so bodily transformation is the last part of this destiny that we have. And a lot of people are saying we're going to just kind of, we're going to kind of do it ourselves, you know, the ones. uh, And, you know, I... There's something about the Word of Faith movement that that I think made us a little more susceptible to these kinds of doctrines. Because if I can transition, if I can transfigure by my being more in a place of glory, of glory or if I can strive to be closer and better and more faith and all this kind of stuff, then then Jesus is no longer the author and the finisher of faith. And Paul said, I'm not, it's no longer, I'm not, it's, uh, it's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me, and it's, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So, 
it's not, you know, if, if it was up to Paul to have to do it, he would never have said that. But, but the, the, the uh, um, faith is authored and finished uh, by Jesus uh, in us. Amen? Amen? It doesn't mean you can't get more revelation about Jesus, but it's not going to speed up your becoming, suddenly becoming a, you know, you're going you're gonna to get on a mountain of transfiguration yourself and go start glowing. That's not, I, and I can tell you it's not going to happen because that's where we're going to go next. Is that okay? Well, let's, let's go see what Paul says. Now, if you can get some, uh, I, I can't find somebody beyond Paul as far as the, the apostle to the Gentiles that I can count on what he's saying any more than I can, you know, with, this, with, with, with what he writes, okay? He, you know, um, the, on the road to Emmaus, the, the couple that Jesus joined himself to right after his resurrection, they walked seven hours, and he began to reveal himself out of all of the Psalms and the Old Testament. And um, In fact, that's all, that's all they had was the Psalms and the, the, the law and the, and the prophets. But he spent seven hours walking on the road with them, on the road to Emmaus. That what means warm springs, Emmaus. And, um, and this is going to be, we're going to share more about this in, in the, the section on the Word here on the last Sunday of the, of the year. But that, that says their heart burned, began to burn within them yeah. as they began to see the reality of who Jesus was. So, um, let's go to... Uh, so. Well, that the well, yeah, it was the, then Jesus sat down and had communion with them, and then he disappeared, and they were full of energy. yeah, I mean, I, they were they were pumped up. Yeah. Nobody that can pump you up like Jesus can, mm-hmm. not even Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? Uh, now, uh, let's go to let's go to First Corinthians fifteen. First Corinthians fifteen. I'm thankful for true love today, aren't you? His love, He is true love, and He gives true love. 1 Corinthians 15. Okay, y'all with me? Uh, All right. We're going to start, let's start it about around, let's see, verse 48. The one, uh, see the, let's go to, go to 47. The, the, the first man, who's the first man? Anybody, anybody, I see, I'm looking around for any Adams. We don't have any Adams in here this morning, do we? Okay. Um, the first, the first man was from the dust of the earth. The second man is Yahweh from the realm of heaven. The first one made from dust has a, has a race of people. All of us were at one time part of that race, right? Uh, y'all see this? Uh, that was just like him. We're trying to tell people that are born just from the, the man of dust to behave like somebody that's born from above. And the world, the world can never respond to that kind of, but they can respond to the fact that he wants to give you true love because he is true love and he gives true love. That's what the world needs to be hearing from the church. And that's what Paul is, Paul is trying to say. Okay, y'all with me? So it says the one sent... Uh, has a race of people just like him who are also made from dust. So these bodies that we're living in that were per- per- born of that first Adam, eventually these are going to fall back to the ground. Most of, you know, everybody has generations of family that are, I, we have a family cemetery in East Texas. Uh, I have five generations buried there. And uh, in there, that, that, that's, that corrupted system cannot go on eternally. So the one, the one, and I notice the one, <laughs> the one in that verse is capital O. Y'all see that? The one sent from heaven has a race of, a, of people who are what? Entirely like him. 
Once we carried the likeness of the man of dust, but now it says, it says let us, but, we, but it also in the footnote says we shall carry the likeness of the, heaven, the, the man of heaven. Now, in this context, Paul is talking about the physical body it's because he goes on to in the next, what's the title over the next verse? Transformation, Transformation is coming, folks. I don't know why I was always... Anybody ever likes the old, the old Superman movies? Yeah. What was the guy... What was his name, the actor? Steve Reeves. Steve, is it Steve Reeves? Chris Reeves. Chris Reeves. Yeah, Chris, Chris Reeves. You know, one of the... The, the, the one I'm, I'm, I'm... Can I go on one little foot... foot? That's right. Yeah, Chris Reeves. No. Oh, yes. oh, I don't mean the. I don't mean. No, I don't mean the 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 one that was on TV that visited I Love Lucy and all that. I don't. I don't. Remember that one? Where he just swings the piano out of the way. Yeah. He was supposed to come to Little Ricky's birthday party, and so. He didn't. Answer, he didn't say he. He had to bow out, and so Lucy tried to dress up like <laughs> Superman. And uh, anyway, it didn't go so well. Okay, where where am I? Footnote. Foot, I was I was on a on a rabbit trail. But one of the one of the movies you remember where Chris Reeves is in love with Lois Lane, and he gives up his superpower. Superman does, and he becomes mortal. All right, y'all remember that one? Goes into the the coffee shop and the guy, the truck driver, beats him up. Remember that one? I've seen it. I liked the very last part of that movie so bad, so good when he goes back in there. Uh, you know which one I'm talking about? The the last, yeah, where he gets his superpower back, and and he he goes back in there and the same truck driver sitting at the, and uh, didn't go the same the second time. And he just said, "I've been working out." <laughs> but what the point of that mess, the point of that movie was that he he came down, left his place of power because of his love for 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 Lois. But then, uh, it, just when it looked like the enemy was going to win, he traded places with the enemy, and the enemy got destroyed while he got protected through his uh, righteousness, through his uh, not having any sin in his life. So I don't know. Anyway, I, I enjoyed that movie for that reason because it always it reminded me of the gospel. Okay, so y'all with y'all still with me? Okay. Uh, now, uh, verse 50. Now I tell you this, my brothers and sisters, flesh and blood are not able to inherit God's kingdom realm, and neither which will that which is decaying be able to inherit what is incorruptible. That's why these bodies, Paul said it this way, he said, even though our outward man is perishing, our inward man is being renewed day by day. So we'll never stop this, this decaying body from its ultimate end, but one day it's going to happen and we're going to see when right here. Okay? If you get a chance, read this whole chapter at some point because it's just wonderful. The whole, whole chapter 15 talks about this destiny that we have to be exactly like Him, not only in our spirit, but in our bodies. <laughs> it's, it's just, it, you know, hard, hard to imagine. But it is your destiny. It's what you were called to. And if you're listening to me, you're thinking, you're, sometimes we scratch our heads up here, but our heart's saying, yeah, yeah, that's, that's what he made me for. That's how, that's what, that this is what he really made me to, to experience. Okay, so he says, uh, cannot inherit what is incorruptible. Listen, and I will tell you a divine mystery. Not all of us will die, but we will all be transformed it will happen in an instant. So, um, what I'm wanting you to see by what Paul's saying here is in, in the twinkling of an eye, for when the last trumpet is sounded, the dead will come back to life. 
we will be indestructible and we will be transformed. So it's going to happen to everybody that are, that's, that's, that's part of this born of the incorruptible seed. Y'all, y'all follow me? Yes. It's going to happen to every one of our bodies suddenly and instantly. Y'all see that? At the last trump. Now we're going to talk about this more as we get further along in Romans, especially chapter 11 and 12. But it, he, Paul, Paul hones it down to a specific moment in time. And that's why I say I'm excited about, uh, I'm, I'm standing on tiptoe. I'm, I'm, I'm saying, Lord Maranatha. Uh, amen? amen? So, uh, for we will, be, we will discard, discard our mortal clothes and slip into a body that is imperishable. What is mortal now will be exchanged for immortality. And when that which is mortal puts on immortality, and when that which decays is exchanged for what will never decay, then the scripture will be fulfilled, which says death is swallowed up by the triumphant victory. So death, tell me where is your victory, and death, tell me where is your sting. Amen? Because it says in the, it is the sin that gives death its sting and the law that gives sin its power, but we thank God for giving us the victory as conquerors through our Lord Jesus Christ, the Anointed One. Now, let's back up because I want you to see something. I want you to see a transition here. One more transition. Y'all want more? Can you, can, you, can you handle one more? I had to do the second one first because it will make the first one make more sense if, I, if, you're, if you're getting anything out of what I'm saying anyway. Anybody, anybody with me? Yes. Are you thinking about salt grass? No. All right. Verse, uh, verse 20. Same chapter, chapter 15, verse 20. But the truth is, hallelujah, Christ is risen from the dead. And as the first fruit of a great resurrection harvest of those who have died. For since death came through a man, Adam, it is fitting that the resurrection of the dead has also come through, one, through a man, Christ. Even, even uh, as all who are in Adam die, so also all who are in Christ will be made alive. You will see that? But each in its, or, in its proper order. Christ, the first fruits, then those who are belong to Christ that is in, in, in His revealing or in His, pre, you know, when He present, presents Himself, the final time. Y'all, y'all follow me? Verse 24, then the final stage of completion comes. And everybody say, hallelujah. Do you like the, fi- do you like the finish line? Uh, sometimes that last, what do they call that? Uh, the last 10 yards, what's, what's that? Red zone. The red zone, yeah. The red zone, uh, it, it seems like it's a long way from the 10-yard line to the goal line. But it's not very far, okay? So, um, now I want you to see the completion of this. <clears throat> then the final stage of completion comes when he, when he will bring to an end every other rulership authority and power and he will hand over his kingdom to to father god until then he is i love this because it's the title of one of joseph prince's book but uh jesus is is right now is the one that's destined to reign and he's destined to reign as king uh and this is that's out of the aramaic language as king until most hostility has been subdued all, okay, yeah, all hostility has been subdued and placed under His feet. Hebrews says, you know, we, God has placed everything under His feet, but we don't see everything yet under His feet, do you? Do we? There's some things that are left that are not there yet, but they will be, including sickness, disease, and death. Amen? 
And so, the la- and it says right there, the last enemy to be subdued and eliminated is death itself. Isn't it, isn't it wonderful to know that death will eventually be uh, annihilated and, and, and eliminated? The Father, look at this. This is where, this is where I want you to see the distinction between the Trinity, uh, but there's no change in who they are together, okay? They're, they're inseparable, but, yes, but yet separate in their uh, person, the three persons, okay? You see this? Follow this, verse 27. The Father has placed all things in subjection under the feet of Christ, Yet when it says all things, it's understood that the Father does not include Himself. For He is the one who placed all things in subjection to Christ. However, when everything is subdued and in submission to Him, then the Son Himself will be subject to the Father, who puts all things under His feet. This is so that Father God will be everything in everyone. We have, a, we have a heavenly Father, a loving Father, who we have a destiny. Uh, our, our destiny is to be one with the Son and one with the Father the way they're one with each other. Yeah. So in the end, Jesus has everything that's been, which is everything will be sub- subjected and subdued by Jesus himself. And when it all is finished, including death, then he'll give it back to his Father and all of a sudden the completion that we will have, that the Father himself, which is, our, which is the, the destiny, is the Father himself, will be everything in everyone. That's powerful. Yeah, it was. I get it, can I get one, maybe a one, little, one little amen? Okay. Uh, now, I don't want to, we're, we're going to skip over, because uh, I, I have to get to this. Uh, let's skip over Colossians. Read that Colossians 3, 1 through 4, one of my favorite passages. Because it, it, it's, it, it says that Jesus' resurrection is your resurrection too. And then he goes on to tell, tell them that, um, hey, we got, we, got, we, got, we, got, we got enough time. Can, can, okay, let's just go there. It's only four verses. Colossians chapter. It's just too good. It's just too, too good not to include. Uh, as I said a little bit earlier, a little bit, a little while ago, we are one with Christ in His glory. You see yourself there? When you get up in the morning and you look in the mirror, who do you see? No, you should. Yeah, I mean, you. Should, I mean, that's, I, I do a lot of times. But who am I supposed to be seeing? Christ in me. Amen. Because I'm a new creation in Him. I'm. I'm. Uh, that's. That's. Uh, it's what. It's what it's saying. I'm one with Christ in glory. So, if you don't see yourself that way, then you're going to go back to what Paul said, and it's all the things you're enduring are going to be the distraction that keeps you downcast all the time. I have, you know, I, I, it's so hard sometimes to try to get people out of the victimhood they're in. Because, see, the, the father of lies is feeding so many people so well. And they're, in, they're, they're, in, they're kind of engorging themselves. And I know people that deal with, with uh, in health care, especially related to psycho, the, the psychological aspect of things, what they identify with will be... Uh, where they 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 either will pat, will either get come out or go further into uh, darkness. It's how they identify with the truth. Amen. And it's not self help, right? Biggest section of any bookstore is self help. You can help yourself when you know who you are in Christ. You can begin to see the truth, and the truth will begin to make you free. Amen? So, he, um, where, where am I? Okay, Christ's resurrection, your resurrection too. This is why we are to yearn for all that is above, for that's where Christ sits enthroned, in the place of power, honor, and authority. Yes, feast on all the treasures of the heavenly realm and fill your thoughts with heavenly realities and not with the distractions of the natural realm. 
not the things you're enduring, but the things that he's, he's, uh, he, that he has redeemed uh, and will eventually will come under his feet in the glorification of not only your uh, everything in your life, but your body itself. Okay? Your crucifixion with Christ has severed the tie to this life. And now your life, your true life, is hidden away in God, in Christ. And as Christ himself is seen for who, re- who re- he really is, who you really are will also be revealed, for you are, n- you are what? Now. now one with him in his glory. If you want to, you know, the psalm, I mean, psalm, psalm 17, I put it in your notes, didn't I? Psalm 17, 15, David recognized this. David saw this, and, and he said, that I, will, I, I will be satisfied when I awaken in his likeness. When I, when I wake up to who I am in him, that's where my satisfaction is going to come. Hallelujah. Amen? <coughs> so, uh, that's the good news of what, where, we're, where we're at right here. So, let's go to Revelation. This is probably everybody's favorite book, right? Before BG, Briscoe, you know, before BG, not BC, but before Grace, I did not ever like to read Revelation. Anybody else? Who has that ever changed? And so has Song of Songs and so many others. But Revelation, I used to hate these letters because I thought, who in the world has any hope? Uh, the letters to the churches. But I want you to see this one because this, you are part of the body of Christ. Amen? Are you? So His Christ lives His life in you. And so it's so important for how we express that, not only to the world, but to ourselves. There, you know, I, I know uh, Susan's watching. I know... Uh, we use the word homologio and, and um, exologio quite, quite often. But, you know, you've got to see, your, you gotta see who, you are, who you really are um, because of what he's done in your life. And you've gotta, that's, that's the way you have to express your life. So uh, he writes these letters, the, the, uh, the, Rev, the Revelation, John, the, the Apostle John, which really means, revelation means unveiling. So this is really about unveiling, uh, unveiling Jesus. And so when you get to the, the second chapter, he starts to write these, he says, the, 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 the Spirit says to, uh, to John, okay, I want you to write these, I want you to write these words. Uh, so G, Jesus says to, uh, Okay, for, for the, <clears throat> write the following for the messenger of the congregation in Ephesus. Now, could anybody just give me a, just a little... Ephesus was the church with the revelation in the, in the first half of the first century. Paul spent three years there. He rented a school building. The only school that you'll ever see mentioned in the Bible is in the book of Acts, chapter 19 and 20. He rent a school, rented a school building because he could just, that's the only way he could keep the people, the confusers, from coming in and messing up the gospel, which is all about Jesus. And so, for, so the, the, these people, he was preaching every day in this school. For, for, for two or three years, he was preaching every day. So they became a, a spiritual superpower. Uh, and, and it began to spread across the rest of, the, of Asia and Europe. So he, he, but then over time, this, this is the Apostle John here at the end of the first century. It says, uh, For these are the words of the one who holds the seven stars firmly in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden stand, uh, lampstands, which is the seven chur- the churches. <laughs> he's, he's walking in the midst of us right now. I know, that all, I know all that you've done for me. You've worked hard and perse- persevered. 
I know that you don't tolerate evil. You have, you have tested those who claim to be apostles and proved them that they're not. As they are imposters, I also know how you have bravely endured trials and persecutions because of my name. Yet you have not become discouraged. It's less than nothing, right? But I have this against you. You have abandoned the passionate love you had for me at the beginning. Now, this used to bother me. Because then, because I read it this way, I thought, I'm not, I don't love him as much as I should anymore. And, I, and, and, it, and it was always, so, so what, what do I do? What do I do with that? How do I love him more? Okay. So, let's look at the footnote. There's two footnotes I want you to see here. Y'all with me? You have abandoned the passionate love you had for me at the beginning. Okay, let's, that's footnote one on verse four, the, the, which would be uh, the letter G. Uh, <clears throat> our first love, look at that sentence that starts with our first love. Y'all see it in the footnote? Our first love is the love God has for us. True love is His love for you. Right? You see that? Uh, being loved deeply and eternally is the definition of our first love. It is a love that will be expressed by our passionate devotion to Jesus Christ and in seen in our relationships with others. Y'all, y'all see that? Okay, so now let's read on. Uh, think about how far you've fallen and repent. The word repent there means mer- uh, metanoia. And do, and do the works of love. Okay, let's look at that footnote. Repent. Every believer needs to turn from his or her error and take another mind, the mind of Christ. Now, let's finish why that this, this means what, it's, what he's trying to say here. Let's look in the next, the next page. Y'all on page 724 now? You, that you did at first, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place of influence. Jesus Christ wants His church to have influence in the world. You all with me? If you do not repent... Although, to your credit, you despise the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also despise. You know, y'all know what that is, right? It's, it's to try to, uh, to rule over the people, you know, to bring the church, you know, one down here to this place. And the leadership of the church are the, the ones that they, they just get, they dress fancier and fancier and they walk around and they have this, there's this bigger and bigger separation between the people that they have the, the, the right to tell people whether they're right with God or not. Uh, I mean, you can carry, you know, these rituals that the Nicolaitans are all about, we're all about rituals, you know. You can carry around a smoke container, you know, and spread smoke around or whatever. Or you can have the Holy Spirit, and it's just, you know, it's up to you. But he got, Jesus just hates this separation in, the, in a hierarchy in the church. should never be a hierarchy in the church. There are fivefold leadership, but never to put themselves above. All right, y'all with me? Okay, so uh, so the place the place of influence. Uh, so what is a, what is what is the influence of the church? How do how does the church maintain its influence to the world. Staying connected. connected. But based upon what we just talked about, first love. In love. Yeah. So how does the church... Absolutely. That's right. 
the the more and I love I love our our friend uh, Pastor Samuel in California, but the more you remind you re, you're reminded by others and even within yourself of His perfect, unconditional, unchanging, eternal love for you that can never be corrupted or diminished. Go back to when we're going to finish up with Romans eight. See, it starts with no connect, no condemnation, and ends with no separation. Who can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus? We can. How do we do that? Because we get the focus on how much we're trying to love Him. And the church is so caught up in what, what I'm doing to impress God with my, my love for Him and pointing the finger at everybody for what they're doing that I've lost, we lose the place of influence because we're not accepted because of what we've done, are we? We're accepted because of what He's done. And when we accept what He's done for us, that's accepting His perfect love for us. And when we accept His perfect love, then that's where the, the influence, the people, will, the people will want to be influenced by a church that's telling them how much Jesus loves them and how much He wants to be uh, their true love. He, he, he is and, get, and wants to give them true love. Y'all see that? All right, we got one more, one more section here. I want to go through. It's it's just in the it's the it's uh, true love, true and perfect love. Um, it eventually, has to work in you. He has to work it into you. How much he loves you before he can work it through you. You can't be an influence about how much look God. Love, you know, he's not loving me because of what I'm doing. Amen? Amen. What I'm doing changes when I know how much he loves me. It's called fruit. New heart. New creation heart. Okay, so uh, let's let's and then so. It's not supposed to be about religious rituals. So many people are going to churches and they're, they're, they're being lorded over. I hate to use that term, but that's kind of what, that's what the Nicolaitans, is what the, that's what it's all about. Being lorded over with a bunch of rituals um, that have no power and no, no presence of God of, of, in reality. It's a conditional love that's based upon your response to their instructions. Anybody been, lived under that at all? It's it's, it's still we're it's still we're tr- still under that pressure. Okay, For the last section is the, the last section of your notes. There, First Corinthians chapter thirteen, verses twelve and thirteen. This is the amplified version. You don't you can go there in the the, the passion, but it's, it's I wrote it out because it's just so powerful. For now we are looking in a mirror that gives only a dim, blurred reflection of reality as in a riddle or enigma. But then when perfection comes, we shall see in reality and face to face. Oh, I'm, I'm just, I'm so looking forward to there not to be, not being anything. Now I know in part, imperfectly. But then I shall know and understand fully and clearly, even in the same manner I have been fully and clearly known and understood by God. I, I, this, there's such joy in the reality that He already knows me, how, who I really am. And it's His son or it's his, his daughter. He already knows me that way. But He wants me to know me that way too. And one day it'll be face to face, and there'll be no, no gray areas or shade, you know, there'll be a perfect reality and realization of who you really are as a result of this new being part of this vast family of God that's just like Him. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, and then He says, uh, and so faith, hope, and love abide for now. When we get to that perfect place, there's no more faith and no more hope. It's all going to be realized. Amen. And what's, it going, to, what's, what's going to be left? Love. His perfect love for you, which is all that is the reality we're trying to get to anyway. Amen. Amen. 
So, uh, faith is the conviction and belief respecting man's relation to God and divine things. Hope is the joyful and confident expectation of eternal salvation. But, but look at this definition for what true love is. True love, uh, true affection for God and man, how does that come? It grows out of God's love far and in us. Yeah, for us and in us. Amen? Amen. All right, so that's we're, we're, what, the reason I put John 17 here. Uh, John 17, those verses, uh, <clears throat> verses 17, chapter 17, verses 2, 6, 9, 11, 12, 22, are all verses where Jesus is praying for us and He's calling us the ones that his father had given him. Every time he, every, in every one of these verses, he's, he's, he's referring, he's saying, Father, I'm praying for these that you've given me. So the father, even in weddings, who gives the bride away? And who does he give the bride to? The groom. And that's what you're you're the you're the bride and his son is the groom. And so he's given you to him. And that's what Jesus is acknowledging and praying for. And so the last thing that he prays throughout John 17 is Father that they would be one with us the way we're one with each other. That's that's his prayer. Is that you think it might get answered? Yes. I think there's a pretty good chance that the prayer that Jesus prayed is going to get answered. Amen. Uh, hallelujah. Let's take communion together. Eric, yes, absolutely. You know, as you've been preaching today, and you've been preaching about love, and, and I was looking at Luke 2, the, the Christmas story, and the thing that the angels pronounced is they said peace and goodwill to men. But, but they said peace. And um, and I was thinking about peace and, and just the reality of, you know, feeling like you're in peace. And I'm thinking, you know, some days like you have on this list of all these things you need to accomplish and task. And sometimes I'll feel like I have ADD and, you know, things are disordered around me. I didn't get it done. And I'm thinking, I don't feel peace, you know, because everything's messed up. It's not in order. I didn't accomplish what I wanted to. And then you think in your life, this over here is not going right. This over here is not finished. How's it going to turn out? And, you know, this sense of a lack of peace. But then I realized um, true peace is like that picture uh, that we've seen where it's like a hurricane force storm happening and there's rocks and there's the ocean and the winds are blowing it and then in the cleft of the rock in the midst of this huge storm is a nest and it's a like a mother bird with her little uh little baby birds protected and safe and that is the picture of true peace is that when everything's not perfect when everything's not finished, when everything's not complete, we have the peace of God in our lives. And, um, and I felt that one day. I was like, you know, okay, so everything's not in order. I haven't finished everything. I still have peace. I have peace with God. And the greatest peace is being absolved of guilt because guilt will steal your peace. And Ephesians 1, 7 says, We have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Yes. You now possess the forgiveness of sins. And then Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ. And it says now, right now, there's no condemnation. And so that's the peace that the angels were pronouncing as, as Jesus was being born. Your peace has come. 
Your peace is not in your perfection. Your peace is not in your perfect circumstances. Your peace is a person. Yes. And you, if you have Jesus, you have a, a peace that is settled on the inside of you that's a deep peace. And it's like that mother bird with those little baby birds. The storm can be blowing around you, but you can still have the peace of God. And I just encourage y'all in that today. If my destiny could be changed, I, w- I would never really have the peace she's talking about. But knowing that it can never be changed. I can, no matter what's going on, I can endure what's going on because I know my destiny is secure already. That's why Paul could sing in the back of a prison in, in chains at midnight, and the earthquake shakes, and that's why he could do that because he already, see, he, already, he knew what his destiny already was. He wasn't living in the enduring. <laughs> he was living in the deliverance, the, the eternal destiny. And that's where peace really can... He wants us to live in that peace of knowing that our destiny is secured. Amen? Amen? It can't ever be changed, no matter what happens. And a lot happens. A lot happens every day that we, we don't have answers to all of it. Right, Mark? But we know the answer is ultimately... It's already, it's a, it, it, our destiny is a done deal. It's already sealed and given to us all the way from the beginning of time. And throughout eternity, it's, the, it's unchangeable reality in our lives. Lord, we thank you for the, for the gospel, we, the good news of what you did to forever give us our new identity and, and, our, and our new inheritance in you. All that you are, And all that you have has been given to us through the sacrifice of your son, Father. We're just so so grateful for that. Lord, we thank you for your body that was given for us. And we thank you for the the brokenness of it that we look to for the for the ultimate victory in our bodies. And so whether it's whether it's all happening physically or all of our diseases are being healed all now or whatever's happening. We know that ultimately our bodies are going to be just like yours. And so we're thankful for that uh, sacrifice. We thank you for the by your stripes. You know, we are healed even in this life because you, you said that that was the purpose for what you did. You, you, just, you absorbed the curse into your body so that you could dissolve it out of ours. Amen? And every sickness and every disease that you listed uh, that was part of the curse is part of that. And so we, we continue to feed and feast upon you with the confidence being in, your, in the truth of that, of that uh, sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen. And the blood of the new covenant, the blood that you shed, that, that causes us that, to have a perfect righteousness now, that, cause, that causes us to be able to boldly and freely stand before you and just be your son. And be your daughter. We have nothing to prove, nothing to try to make happen. We're there uh, as your delightful children, whom you delightfully love. And so we just want to we just want to enjoy the the the, the benefit of this pr- perfect righteousness and perfect uh, redemptive work that you've given to us. And I love Dave, how David put it in Psalm twenty three. That you prepared us, you prepared this table right in front of our enemies. There's nothing he can do about it. Amen. He can't do anything about the reality of what you've done through your sacrifice of yourself. Amen. Thank you for just pouring this table and setting this table in front of us while the enemy just think, man, I wish I could mess that up. But he can't. Nope. It's forever settled in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to go to we're going to go eat some steak. Uh, on, a, on a lighter note, I was, anybody, y'all sing the 12 days of Christmas? Anybody? Anybody ever sing that? I, was, I, felt, I felt like I got tickled by the Holy Spirit this morning because I was going through that. Do you remember what the first, the first one is? Partridge in a pear tree. Two turtle doves. That's it. That's right. 
three French hens, four, four, four calling birds, five golden rings. You know, and then I heard the Holy Spirit say, stop, just stop. Just, what you need to do is stop right there. Because the number five is grace. So st- stop with that. But then you get, what, what's the next one? Six, that's, that, that's a tongue twister, isn't it? Six geese, geese are laying, uh, seven swans are swimming, eight maids, nine dancing, ten lords are leaping, pipe, pipers piping, twelve drummers drumming. You ever give your child a present at Christmas, a, an instrument like a drum or a, 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 or a trumpet, and you're thinking, what was I thinking? Can you imagine, can you imagine 12 drummers drumming? And then, and then I felt like the Holy Spirit said, what you need next is 13 sh- uh, shovelers shoveling, because you're going to have a mess in that house. That's, just, just, look about, just look at all of that. Amen. Well, let's go. Let's go enjoy some fellowship and food together, and we'll we'll come back in two weeks. Merry Christmas to y'all that are watching. Wish y'all could be with us today. Uh, David, good. To see, David and Mary and Tina. Tina's in a lot of pain, so pray for Tina. We're so glad that that's behind you, you know, that that's over with. And so we're going we're gonna to go eat lunch together. And David, wish y'all were here. Mary, enjoy your Christmas. We'll see you in two weeks. Amen. God bless y'all.